1900, a group of pioneers embarked on an adventure that was designed to persuade a sceptical public that as the world entered a new century, the horseless carriage was not just a gentleman's plaything, but that the motor car could be taken seriously as a new form of transportation. In 2014, the Royal Automobile Club and Hero recreated that event, which has now become a firm favourite with owners of pre-war classics. Open to these majestic vehicles from the period, this is the story of the 2016 event, when another intrepid group of adventurers gather together to repeat that epic journey and commemorate the first ever reliability trial staged here in the UK. We can't wait, we can't wait to get started. This is a great rally and some fantastic cars around. We've got a Rally 9 Special. I think it was called the Dustbin Special because at the time the rear sections we made from an old dustbin, but it's had a, a little bit of a makeover since then. This is a Riley Sprite 1938. This one did once the Monte Carlo Rally. For these adventurers, their classics are more than just wheels and drive shafts. I love this car. We hope that we can perform to the level of the car. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to get to the end without any mishaps. Starting this year north of the border from Edinburgh's Maison Hotel in the now trendy Docklands district, the trial winds its way south along some of the UK's best driving roads and most beautiful scenery right through the heart of England to finish five days later at the country home of the Royal Automobile Club, Woodcote Park. There would be highs and lows, but would all of them make it? The entries this year would include an array of priceless machinery. We are having fun, a lot of fun. First time here with the Hero and we have a great expectation. The car is a 1922 Bugatti. Perfect. We brought a Bentley called the Bluebell. It started racing in 39 and it ended in 2002. It's the first time we take her for a long rally like this. We hope she's going to be fine. Ben Cousins and Christian Hall would be armed with a Bentley 6, prepared by Bentley Ace Restorer William Metcalf. We've got the, the beautiful Shorty here, four and a half litre Bentley, really prepared for this great event. My co driver there, Christian, panning in. Hello! I've absolutely no idea what to, uh, to expect of it, it's my first one, so, uh, yep, yeah, very excited. But for some, even making the start would prove to be a challenge. It won't start. That brush there is completely worn away. This one you can see is a little left. But that's what happens with cars and that's why we love them. And if we don't get this finished, I'll be pushing it the whole way around. <laughs> Scrutineering is an essential part of any rally to ensure a car's roadworthiness. I'm checking the integrity of the steering and the sporked wheels, uh, suspension, checking the, uh, the right, right carburetor configuration. Lighting, of course, fuel tank integrity, make sure that the filler cap hasn't, hasn't any leaks on it or won't leak a bit if the car is unfortunately in an accident. It's a mini MOT basically. we signing on dealt with, the navigators could get on with the serious business of working out the mission ahead. All we're doing is trying to highlight the bits that we think are going to be tricky. And in doing the tests, it just helps me personally to remember which way we're going to go. Do as much preparation as you can and hope that you're going to get it right. That's the theory. Whether it works in practice is another matter. In keeping with the grandeur of the event, it was fitting that the welcome dinner be held aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia. Britannia was in service from 1954 to 1997 and she travelled more than a million miles around the globe and on board was stored Her Majesty's own classic. Car enthusiasts, I give you Britannia's garage. The Rolls Royce Phantom 5, this is the one that was used by the Queen between 1960 and 1978 for official state visits overseas. When Britannia was first built, a garage was considered not an optional but an essential because they were always going to need a car. It was felt wherever they were going. As the sun sets over Leith Harbour, the crews relax late into the evening before the rigours of the morning's rally. <laughs> As the crews assemble for the start of the thousand mile trial, nerves and anticipation were high. <laughs> 
Perfect. A real challenge of man and machine. Very, very tough on the car, very physical for the driver and the navigator as well. I would say so, yeah. We'll try and keep our old cars going. A thousand miles is a, a fair old way. The ceremonial start saw last year's winner John Abel in his 1937 Lagonda first away at one minute past nine, closely followed by a steady stream of exotic machinery. Including the priceless 1922 Bugatti Type 13 of Franco Magno. The first leg would take the crews from Edinburgh across the border to Hexham in Northumberland. As the cars headed east, the morning was a fairly gentle introduction to the trial with two regularities and a test to ease the cruising. Clark of the course guy Woodcock had tried to recreate some of the original route from 1900, but with the march of time, many of the roads had changed. Just a few miles into the journey and problems are already mounting for the White Sisters. Battery yeah. was dying, so we lost on that, that whole reg. I was doing it without trip and without a clock. So I was kind of guessing where we were going. And then that last little hill was just it. And it just went kaboom. The first coffee stop was at the National Museum of Flight, home to another magnificent machine. Well, here we are, we're at East Fortune. East Fortune is an old World War II bomber base. And, of course, behind us we've got Concorde. It's wonderful to, to see it. I have happy memories of flying a couple of times in Concorde. The first regularity was just quite straightforward, so just to get everybody into the swing of things. I've got that in mind. So far, so good. With the time control completed, some of the crews were feeling upbeat from a successful first section. Good start. Yeah, I think we got a uh, good time in the fast test, certainly, and no disasters in the navigation, but so far it's pretty easy. So it gets tougher as the day goes on, I'm sure. The oldest car in the rally, the 1922 Bugatti Type 13, was already feeling the pressure of the Scottish roads. Problem? Yeah, well, magneto problem. With I'm very confident. <laughs> I know, everybody's doing this best. <laughs> the mechanics had their work cut out for them as the 1937 Jaguar SS was also experiencing problems. Is there? Yeah. It's running very rich on the front three cylinders and we're just adjusting the carburetor, the front carburetor of the SUs and it's causing a misfire, especially on the test when I'm waiting and queuing. It's, foul, it's time to foul the uh, plugs up so we're just trying to weaken the mixture a little bit. With a problem fixed on the Jaguar, a non-starter for the Bugatti. It was also a close call for the 1933 Alfa Romeo Spider. <laughs> the next section saw the crews complete two regularities. Going in about 20 seconds, Peter. Three, two, one, go. With the English border on the horizon, the crew stopped for lunch at the magnificent Floors Castle, Scotland's largest inhabited fortress. First task, time control. We're trying to book all the cars in at the time control at lunch, and they're here for 40 minutes, and then we'll book them out with a yellow clock when they go 40 minutes after they've booked in. Even rivals find a moment to discuss the standings. 
Yeah, yeah this is the overall position. It didn't yeah. look too bad, but I don't know what, Where what are you? happened. We're here. That's not too bad. That's all right. But there's nothing in it at the moment. It's only day one. It's only morning one. Okay. It's too early to mourn or to, or to laugh. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's going well. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm average uh, happy, I think. We've had small penalties on the, uh, on the regularities and we've gone a little bit quicker than a few cars I thought we might not do on the test, so happy enough. Current leaders Paul Crosby and navigator Andy Pullen in their MGTB have managed to eke out a one second lead. But it was John Abel that realised he had to raise his game. We just now need to go faster. Early days, yeah, John. We got beaten on the test, so, um, you know, I need to try harder, I think. Right, another afternoon of motoring, onwards and upwards. Dr. Wheels cronking. <laughs> <laughs> Competitive afternoon of three regularity sections, the close working relationship between driver and navigators tested. The slightest error in such an evenly matched field can affect the standings. The final regularity of the day would take the crew south of the border into Northumberland through the Cheviot Hills. What's happening? It's been a good rally so far and we're just improving as the day goes by. One, go. No, core plug is leaking. So we're losing water all the time. Yes, it's true. All I do is for you. You make me feel a better shade of blue. All I do is for you. You make me feel a better shade of blue. At the end of the day, and with over 200 miles under their belts, most of the crews remain in good spirits. There were some ups and some downs, <laughs> but I uh, enjoyed it. Great fun. Plain sailing. Efficient teamwork on both sides, I'd like to put it down to. It's not tight, and it just lifts itself and then you slide backwards. There's a bit of a misfire when we stop the car and then start it again. And the monitor's not working, and the seat's moving about. But other than that, it's great. We had a bit of a scare because on the steepest hill we had so little fuel and it just stopped. At the end of day one, the lead had changed with Anderson and Powley in their Bentley derby overhauling Cosby and Pullen's lunchtime lead. The battle for third place was close, with Paul Wignall and Mark Appleton finishing a mere second ahead of John Abel and Ian Tully. Sue Shoesmith and Trina Harley were also hot on their heels, only a second off the pack, coming in fifth and chasing hard in their Bentley. It's very early days, so um, I think it, I mean, there's probably half a dozen people who are capable of winning this. Um, everything goes their way. Another day in the saddle. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a winning feeling today. Day two of the trial dawned to the sound of mechanical woes for a number of crews. Franco and Robinio Manjo in the Bugatti were not in such good spirits as the Magneto Gremlins from the day before had halted their progress. We're having Magneto problems and so we try hard until uh, late evening yesterday, but uh, nothing to do, nothing we can do. So we load the car uh, on the Strike 8 uh, truck and then uh, we will try to repair this afternoon and hopefully we will be back. Three, two, one, yes. The morning's driving activity began with two tests to negotiate in the grounds of Slaley Hall. With the 
protests now behind them, the journey south would present the cruise with another 200-mile epic, cruising through the heather-covered moorland of Northumberland, with regularities keeping the navigators on their toes. We're enjoying ourselves, even if we did get lost. That's yours. Three, two, one. The scenic route took in the moorland landscape of Northumberland and led the crews to the morning time control and a quick coffee break at the beautiful Bose Museum with its famous art collection. For some of the crews, it was a gentle meander around the priceless art collection, but for Thomas de Vargas Machuca, driving the 1936 Adler, his woes were slowing progress. He uh, tried to fix the car last night and uh, it was okay for a couple of miles but obviously there needs to be a little bit more work uh, going, um, so we'll try again, and again, and again, and we'll sort it out, hopefully by the time the rally finishes. The trials route continued south over Stangmore and on towards Coverdale, with Wharfdale following the same roads used on the English leg of the Tour de France. And we've made it up the last hill, so could be happier. What's happened here yeah, then? Rakes. <laughs> but we found the I friendliest, found the nicest people. And despite the occasional hiccup, the spirit of camaraderie on hero events guarantees that there will always be help from fellow competitors. We run off the road. The road moved in the wrong direction, you know? Where there's a will, there's a way. For the little MGTA, the big hills of Widdup Moors were all too much. It died going up the hill. The point spring has just broken. Well-earned lunch stop nestled in the beautiful surroundings of Bolton Abbey gave the crews a chance to charge up for the afternoon. We run out of battery and uh, it's dead, so we have to change it now. But we have a spare battery with us, so we were prepared. We had this brilliant idea at 2 a.m. in the bar, like to swap cars, you know. It's all these ideas for a the next day, morning. So, yeah, I want to check out the competition. We're just hoping this might improve our... I might regret it. We're going to swap back before the regularity because <coughs> oh, yes. Yes. leading people in the, uh, the rankings, we don't want to damage our performance. A short regularity takes the cruise briefly into Lancashire. Then on to God's own country, Yorkshire.
After a hard day in the saddle, 210 miles under their belts and a few mishaps, Kenwood Hall will provide a welcome overnight and a chance to reflect on the day. Some very tough twisties this afternoon in the Peak District. Very tough. So we've been taking it really steady today, but there's been one or two little things that have cropped up that uh, I've needed a, a slight amount of attention, which we're just giving it now. It's just that little bit of TLC that it needs after a busy day's rallying. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Who knows what the know. Well, we got stuck behind a woman who stopped in the middle of the road to pick an old gentleman up who was coming out of his front garden like this. And it took us about two or three minutes. And it, he wanted to come and talk about the cars, but of course we were on time. <laughs> we didn't want to talk about the cars. It's been lovely. I'm exhausted. Any dramas? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we overshot a junction and then got um, completely uh, stuck in reverse gear. Yeah, no disasters. Picked a few points up here and there. And uh, we've got 10 on the last regularity, which, you know, not perfect, but it's not bad at all. So, uh, yeah, pretty good, thanks. What happened about you falling in a ditch then? I was uh, being polite to uh, a gentleman with a trailer with a horse in his car and gave him a little bit too much pace and I didn't see the ditch because it was full of grass. So everyone helped me. We're a team. Crosby and Pullen had snatched back the lead from Anderson and Powley. John Abel and Ian Tully looked threatening, claiming third in their Lagonda, with Shoesmith and Harley behind them, creeping up to fourth. A new day dawned for the crews with a total of over 600 miles completed on the rally so far. The cars were really starting to feel the pressure. Another morning and the, the rally's taking its toll on some of the cars. If you look behind you, you'll see there's a few things falling by the wayside. Dodgy connection on the solar oil. Mark Shorty here is uh, firing on all four and we're ready to go. I think there may have been a slight issue, but we are fully confident that they will run the next to the uninterrupted today. I'm not even sure what the issue was, actually. <laughs> Try again! With another eventful drive ahead, day three takes the rally through Sheffield's still country and into Derbyshire, which was once home to Rolls-Royce, and then finally on through the South Yorkshire Moors. As part of the spirit of the rally, the course director is looking to challenge the cars on all kinds of terrain, and that includes a refreshing dip for both car and driver. A quick cream tea at Tissington Hall and a chance to dry off. We hit it. We made a track there. Had the reverse. The water splash was lovely. It was just a little breath of fresh air on a warm day in the sun. And um, my wife got a bit wet, she didn't mind. 10-11 for car 30. <laughs> From Tissington Hall, it was a short excursion to the next test, one that would have the crew's hearts racing. Casualty of day three was to be the Morgan of Simon and Jess Parson. However, Simon had a spare MG up his sleeve. The Morgan, the bottom end of the engine is 
damaged. It's making a terrible rattling noise, the kind of rattle that you shouldn't keep on driving with. One of the great delights of any rally of the driving test when the drivers can ignore speed limits and release their inner racing driver. With only 13 seconds separating the top three crews, a card track was the perfect opportunity to test the metal and close those time caps. Happy Bastille Day. Uh, merci. Merci. Vive la France. <laughs> Vive la France. Are you alright, Bob? No. I'm sure you have all your. After a challenging morning of tests and regularities, lunch was set in the grounds of the gorgeous Hampton Manor, whose history can be traced back to 1066 when it was first recorded in the Doomsday Book. But it was the fun of the morning that was on everyone's minds. We ran a few cones down when we should, but apart from that, it was good. Brilliant test. Half the exhaust dropped off, which I'll hope to fix tonight. Um, I'll never get it from me to turn left, which I did, which really meant right. To everyone's delight, the surprise return of the Bugatti Brescia of Franco and Rubinia, which had been on its own excursion to Oxford for repairs. Would it be making the final leg of the journey? Nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you back, sir. You have a Thank few you. So happy, so happy. We, we, we did a long day yesterday and uh, we are here. We drove all the morning uh, to get back, to be back. <laughs> The final time control of the day would be at the majestic Blenheim Palace. I think it's fair to say we're a bit tired. A, a short day today, only nine hours in the saddle. We still haven't shouted at each other, so we're doing OK. We've had a good day, we've had a good day. We're still lying forth, so uh, we're very pleased. We did a pheasant, you know, it was either a swerve turn the car in, or uh, we wondered if we got extra points from the pheasant, but we didn't. Driving these old cars is not easy work, so, uh, but it's been great. This morning was heavy, some uh, miscommunication, but all the time it was wonderful. Regularities, spot on. Yep. The navigator. We're a team. Much better afternoon go. today, so we are really positively happy. Today everything went super well, so I'm happy. I'm preparing the route for the route for tomorrow. We are waiting for a champagne. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> By the time the crews arrived at the overnight rest in Oxfordshire, Crosby and Pullen were leading, having survived a few mechanical troubles. Unfortunately, we broke a, a front spring yesterday afternoon. I didn't think it was quite as serious, um, so we just carried on, and, and we've been we've been going fine actually the last uh, day. But um, Peter's just looked at it, and it, it's a little bit unsafe. So um, he's doing one of his fantastic um, let's call it a bodge, but it's a, a temporary. Oh, it's a bodge. He's confirmed it is a bodge. An interesting day, full of highs and lows. We arrived to the regularity, and the regularity was closed already. That explains everything. <laughs> Happier than yesterday, that's for sure. And um, there's a good chance we'll get to Woodcote Park, which is uh, half the achievement. The little blue Bugatti always draws a crowd and brings a flavour of Italia to the Oxfordshire countryside. It looks like espresso machine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit dirty espresso. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a grand spectacle. Si, 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 si. I keep on saying, why do people go on the continent when you have such beautiful countryside to see over here? It's been like Turner pictures, absolutely brilliant. At the end of day three, Crosby and Pullen have managed to slightly increase their lead over Anderson and Powley to 12 seconds. John Abel and Ian Tully remained in third, with Shoesmith and Harley refusing to give up fourth. Day four dawned to the sound of engines rumbling and Franco still tinkering with the Bugatti. And there was good news for the White Sisters in their Austin 7. Little Red's back! She's been all fixed and hopefully we'll manage to do at least a day of the 1,000 mile trial. It's not like loads of things can go wrong, but loads of things did seem to go wrong, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Looking forward to a nice and dry, uh, competitive day today. Leaving the hotel, the crews made their way to Bista Heritage, a famous World War II airbase that's now home to an array of classic vehicles. It was also the venue for one of the most anticipated tests of the week. Mind the wheels, <laughs> The time challenge for the crews was to weave their way through the historic buildings. A short run across country led to the morning coffee break where more running repairs were required. Bolts on the universal joint coming out the back of the gearbox, but uh, good job we caught that before it did any more damage. Otherwise it would have been a bit more terminal dragging down the road. And it's a good place to have a breakdown at the T-stop, isn't it? The test went well. I, we were taking it pretty easy because obviously we just want to get through now. But uh, they were really fun. I'd have to say the, the, the muscles are, are weakening now. Uh, it's getting harder. Nick's doing a brilliant job navigating. We only went wrong once. There you go. Thank you. With the timings noted, the crews headed south with two regularities, weaving them through and over the Berkshire Downs. Running classic cars is not about high-tech engine management systems. Francis Galashin and Tony Brooks needed all their low-tech ingenuity to deal with this temperamental old girl. Magneto stopped working. The coil is uh, getting too hot. So what we've done, we've made up a water bath for the uh, coil. Hopefully that will keep it cool to keep the spark going. So we'll take it from now, I hope. Eight hundred miles in, and the rigours of the thousand-mile challenge, the vintage seats of the classic cars, and the daily trials are taking their toll. Oh my God, my watch is hurt. Lunch time. Very good day, very successful day. 
And do you think it's not going to happen, or we just like beat everybody and everything? <laughs> no, we just left the trail behind us, I think. Difficult on the rig, we've been ploughing. It's very difficult on the regularity when there's a car coming the other way on a road that's one car wide. But luckily, we managed to just keep out the ditch. It's prime hay, that. Over lunch at Donington Country Club, it became clear that not all had gone well for Stephen Owen and Niall Frost in their Jaguar SS. We ran a right-hander on the second test, the half shaft broke off and the wheel just shot off, the car skewed sideways. We were out of the uh, test but, uh, and out of the competition. There was no rest for the crews kept on their toes with more regularities in the afternoon, pushing them through the country lanes of rural Hampshire. A quick coffee stop and photo opportunity on the lawn at Avington Park before pushing on to the final test at Goodwood. The final test of day four was in the grounds of Glorious Goodwood. The challenge to pit their metal against the clock on a speed test. Here we are, good with at the race ball. 30 seconds, concentrate. 30 seconds, concentrate. As day four came to an end, it became clear that the front runner favourites had encountered a monumental setback. When you let it off, do yeah. Unfortunately, Paul and Andy have had issues today, which uh, has shook things up at the top. Hopefully, they'll rejoin tomorrow, but that's that they were leading. So, at the moment, we think that's promoted us up into first spot. And it's just really bad luck that, you know, you wouldn't want anybody to go out with that problem when they're in the lead. Unfortunately, on just after the first reg this afternoon, uh, we had a strong smell and um, it turns out a uh, knackered dizzy. The distributor decided it was going to catch fire. We lost, uh, lost a lot of uh, penalty points, or gained a lot of penalty points from missing controls and the test and from a position that we're in at lunchtime. I'm uh, gutted, mortified all sorts of other adjectives, um, but yeah, just got to get on with it. Following their catastrophic engine trouble, the leaderboard looked drastically different with Crosby and Pullen missing from the top spot and off the ball completely. In a stunning shake-up, Abel and Tully have managed to leapfrog Anderson and Powley to claim pole position, and the steadfast duo of Shoesmith and Harley had given up their hold on fourth place, moving up to third. The final day promised a closely fought battle, but after the mechanical woes of the day before, Crosby and Pullin took an alternative approach to the driver-navigator relationship. We're trying a bit of role reversal because um, we lost so many uh, penalty points, or we gained so many penalty points yesterday, we're, we're in no chance of uh, any sort of reward. So I've got the books and the time card and Andy's got the keys, so he's going to drive and I'm going to navigate. Losing a rally yesterday, so we'll start for a bit of a laugh. <laughs> to the other drivers, it felt like the last day of term, complete with some high jinks. I pushed the brake.
The action started with two tests back at the iconic Goodwood circuit. Katarina Kavalova seemed to be collecting as many cones as possible while struggling with some dodgy wiring. These two puppets, they put harm on my brake, so every time when I brake, you can hear me. It's hard work, <laughs> even with the small cars. A lot of fun. We've done two tests in one regularity. I've only scared cars a couple of times on the test. I did get the brake and accelerator mixed up at one point, but we got around the corner just about. Three, two, one, go! We've had a good morning. The gap between the top three now is less than, I think it's 15 12, seconds, 12. 12 seconds between the top three, so it's all to play for, anything can happen. The tests here don't really favour us, they're a bit tight and twisty for us, so we've dropped a few seconds this morning, but we'll, we'll keep at it and see how we go. This next one should be entertaining. Five, four, three, two, one, now Andy, for Christ's sake, can you just keep those averages, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. It's so hard driving. Oh, dear oh. me. Off you go. Good luck. Thanks, Paul. Onwards through the Surrey Hills and to lunch at Denby's Vineyard in Dorking. But while some of the crews enjoyed the welcome, others were contemplating what might have been. Well, a great morning. We haven't done anything wrong. All's well. <laughs> and we're, we, we, we know this place pretty well because we live about 10 miles away. So looking forward to going and perhaps sampling a little bit of wine. I don't think he'll get any wine. <laughs> Water. After losing his Jaguar, Stephen Owen was enviously eyeing up a possible replacement. Stealing his half shafts, and there's one or two improvements on here, like the distributor, uh, the oil filter, uh, SU pumps, it's a modern SU pump. It's nice, it's, uh, it's in good shape. Sad to see yours out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As the drivers made their final run into the finish, news arrived that the front runners had been held up by an unexpected wedding procession, handing victory to Shoesmith and Harley. However, due to the large number of competitors who were affected, Clark of the Cool Sky Woodcock cancelled the last regularity, allowing John Abel to seal his third consecutive win on the Royal Automobile Club 1,000 mile trial. 
very nervy this morning. Stuart and Lee took time out of us on the, the tests at Goodwood, so we thought that might have been it going away from us, but uh, we just about held it together on the last test and got across the line. The whole thing is just perfect. The guys just put benchmark for all rallies for me. For my, I, I think release for not only pre-war rallies, all rallies. It's just perfect. The, 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 the atmosphere of the rally is fantastic. All the people are great. The cars are fantastic. And the competition has been fierce. So you've got it all. It ticks all the boxes. So happy. One of the best events in my life. Mm -hmm. So she deserve a little bit of champagne. Thank you. Thank you, Hero. Oh, it's been fantastic. It was really, really awesome. He was very good. I'm just not sure I like driving with a lunatic. My wife Ilona told me in the car, should it go two more days please now? <laughs> it was great fun. Absolutely fabulous. Fantastic. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> So the final result saw Abel and Tully taking the win. Second place went to Anderson and Powley, who incredibly finished a mere eight seconds behind. And right up there in the mix, Shoe Smith and Harley honourably stepping back to claim third, yet still finishing within striking distance of the top two. Jane Wignall and Kevin Savage cleared up in fourth, ahead of Steve and Julia Robertson in fifth. It's a respect of history. It's a respect and a love of mechanical. It's a respect and love of aesthetical. And at the end, don't forget that it's, uh, it's about pleasure and passion. The winner of this year's Thousand Mile Trial, car number one, John Abel and Ian Tully. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Thousand Mile Trial trophy for the winners. It's particularly nice as we didn't really think we'd get there. Today, uh, after a few incidents this afternoon, so it was a really pleasant surprise to find that we had actually won it. As the festivities continued into the night, the experience and the friendships made during the Thousand Mile Trial left everyone looking forward to the next rally.